Well, good morning, everyone. Merry Christmas. Wow. You guys are still talking to each other. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. <laughs> Merry Christmas. All right. It's so good to be with you. Um, we're in a series uh, called Rediscover Christmas. And as I've been doing some preparation, I have found no shortage of people uh, who want to tell us how to define Christmas. Like Christmas is the time for, and you fill in the blank. Like for a lot of people this time of year, Christmas is the time for buying new jewelry, uh, for uh, updating your cell phone plan and you get four free phones when you start a new line with AT&T. Or uh, maybe this is the time of year when you make a major purchase like an automobile without consulting your spouse. Um, we're talking about peace today. Pretty sure that's not gonna do it. Um, but there's all types of, of definitions that people have attached to Christmas. And we see this in like the stories that we tell, right? And in the movies that we, we like, the characters that we love, like this time of year. Uh, for example, if you've seen or, or read The Christmas Carol, we've only made this movie 19,000 times, um, where the lead character learns that throughout the course of the story that Christmas really is about being more generous, right? Like the, the meaning of Christmas is generosity. Or uh, it's similar to that is Dr. Seuss's The Grinch Who Stole Christmas. Do you remember that one? And like the meaning of Christmas was love or community. Or if you've seen the movie Elf, right? Buddy the Elf uh, throughout the course of the movie teaches us that Christmas is really maybe about family or about believing, or maybe it's that there's room for everyone on the nice list. I don't know, I get confused on that one just a little bit. But we, we have all of these movies, we have all these stories, we have all these characters. Like if I just started naming some Christmas characters, some of you love them so much, you watch the movie every year, they're a part of your traditions, you consider them close friends. Like if I say someone you know, listen, just yell it out, just cheer for your favorite when we get there. One of my favorites is Bart Simpson because he's been on the longest running television show in TV history. And he said it this way. He said, aren't we forgetting the true meaning of Christmas? You know, the birth of Santa, like there's all types. There's all types of reasons to celebrate Christmas. But you know, maybe, uh, maybe some of these other stories appeal to you. Go ahead and yell them out, cheer when you get to see yours. But like, how about George Bailey, right? George Bailey, Kevin McAllister, Clark Griswold. Wow, Clark coming in strong in the 1030 service. Ralphie, John McClain, Luther Crank, Charlie Brown. Oh, sorry, Charlie. Uh, Susie Clark, Scott Calvin, Bob Wallace, Rudolph. You had one job, Rudolph. All right. But all of, these, all of these characters, right, they go throughout the course of their story. And then at the end, right, like the meaning of Christmas is that they become a better version of themselves, right? They learn the lesson. Most of the time, these stories have some type of like self-help, self-improvement, self-realization. There's a moral to the story, a truth, a change, a challenge, a recognition that brings into the character's life more joy, more hope, and more peace for the year to come. I think we do this because culturally, both inside the church and outside of the church, we recognize, right? Come on, Christmas has some power behind it, right? Like there is, there is some power and some meaning in Christmas. In fact, I think culturally we would agree inside the church and outside the church that Christmas has the power for life change. That in the Christmas season, you could have your whole life changed. And certainly, listen, I love it all. I love Christmas presents. I love Christmas food. I love the fact that we decorate everything from where we live to what we eat. I love all of the stories and the music and the characters. I love it all. And here's what my temptation is, and maybe you felt this too. My temptation is to believe that what I should do is I should celebrate Christmas all month long, right? I should just fill up on Christmas for an entire month and then let that change me into a better version of me and I'll just live off of that emotion, right? I'll just live off of that experience for the next 12 months and I'll be a better person. Like there's a temptation there that's reinforced over and over and over again, but... I think it's also my tendency, maybe this is true for you, to in the midst of all of the stories and the movies and the presents and the meanings of Christmas is to forget the true meaning of Christmas, to miss it. And you think, well, how could, how could a pastor miss the true meaning of Christmas? How could he forget what Christmas was supposed to be all about? Listen, guys, I forget why I walked in some rooms. Come on, amen if you've been there. Like I have to remind myself going down the hallway, I'm going to get my coat, I'm going to get my coat, I'm going to get my coat, I have it. Otherwise I get there and I don't know why I came into this room. So it's very possible, right, that we could get to Christmas 
and sort of like get here and be like, why Christmas? Why did I come in here? What's going on? And what if, what if the real meaning of Christmas, the true definition behind it is so obvious, it's in the original story? Like, what if the meaning of Christmas, the true power in life, for life change in Christmas is in the story about a baby born in a barn on a cold night, right? To, you know, what, what, if, what if that's the point of the whole thing and it's right there in front of us and we've just missed it? Let's look at a passage of scripture, very common at Christmas. If you have been around the church at Christmas time for any number of years, you have heard this passage read. If you have celebrated Christmas before, I'll bet someone said something to you similar to what's written here. Luke chapter two, starting in verse eight, follow along with me. It says, and in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all of the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was an angel of multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest, And on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. Okay, now picture this, right? You gotta, we gotta rewind our lives just a little bit because I think sometimes the power and importance of this announcement is lost on the modern generation because we've grown up with IMAX movie theater screens and, you know, concert pyrotechnics. We are talking about a group of men who have never seen fireworks before. They've never seen an airplane before. They may have seen a bird in the sky. Maybe they've seen a big bird, but we only see those when the lights are on and it's daytime. They've never seen a light so bright that it cast out the darkness. They've never heard a voice spoken to them through a PA system or with a microphone. They've never experienced anything like this. And it's so startling. It actually says that they were afraid. They have to be told, hey, don't worry. Nothing to be afraid of here. We've just got some important news. Something powerful and amazing has happened. So we have put together a powerful and amazing announcement. And within that announcement, they say two things. They say, hey, glory to God. God is the one who has done this. God is the one who has brought this about. All glory to him. And then here's what this means to you, shepherds. Here's what this means to the people. Peace on earth. Peace on earth. And it's this word peace that kind of jumps out at us when we read it closely because this is the part that's for us. It's glory to God and peace for you. I wanna focus our time on this word peace, on the power that is found in this declaration of peace. It's a long sought, rarely found quality within people, moments, and experiences. A peace produced by and through the child of Christ. A peace that is possible for all of us through the power of Christmas and a peace for which Jesus Christ is called the Prince, right? He is the authority of the peace. Isaiah 9, 6 says, for unto us a child is born and to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father and Prince of? Peace. Peace. This word, we've heard it used, we're familiar with it. It's not, you know, not a new concept. We, we've seen peace treaties between warring nations. Uh, some of you have asked Santa Claus for peace and quiet at your house for Christmas. That's all you really want, right? Peace of mind keeps us from worrying and staying up all night. If you drive by the high school uh, on the left side of the building, what's it say? It says peace on earth, right? It's this sentiment of goodwill and heartfelt merriment. We use this term peace to mean societal friendship and harmony, a lack of hostility and violence between groups or individuals, right? It's this piece of commonality and rest, this thing that we get to just get to go. (sighs) We say, peace, brother, peace out, peace be still, peace and love, peace within, peace be the journey, and may they rest in peace. It's common in our language. It is less common in our lives, and the announcement of Christ's arrival is an announcement that peace has arrived. But if you're like me, you look around the world, it doesn't seem that peace has arrived. It seems like there's a lot of things going on that are not, by definition, peace. 
So how is it that peace has arrived? If we're saying in this proclamation that peace has arrived, but my experience is that there is no peace, I must then ask the question, and so must you, what do they mean by this word peace? What type of peace did Jesus come to deliver? What is the biblical definition then of this peace? And so I wanna give it to you in four parts. Are you ready to do that? Okay, all three of you, let's go. (laughs) The peace that we need, like hope and joy, right? Peace seems that it is always in limited supply. So we could always use more peace. Where could we use peace? Quickly, we need peace in relationships. We need relationships without conflict. That would be awesome, right? That would be peaceful if we had relationships without conflict. If you remember the movie uh, Home Alone, right? And Kevin, and what's, he's having conflict with all his brother and his mom and, and all of his family. He's got conflict with them. And then like after they leave him home alone, which I don't, I've never, I've never once done this, but it was a lot of kids. I, we try to make excuses for how she ends up looking like the great mom at the end of this movie. I don't understand, but there was conflict in those relationships, If we had peace, if we could have relationships without conflict, we would have a great deal, a great measure of peace within our lives. If people were just easier to deal with, let's be real, if we were easier to deal with, we'd have more peace, right? Relationships would be easier. Listen, nations would stop warring against each other. Political parties would stop hating one another, right? People would be more generous. Marriages would be stronger. Politicians would be more honest. Parents would lead and protect children and children would honor and respect their parents. It'd be much more peaceful on the planet if we had relationships without conflict. We'd be less self-centered, right? And we would express kindness and gentleness and gratitude more willingly. And wouldn't that be great for Christmas? Wouldn't that be an amazing Christmas present? To have peace in relationships, relationships without conflict? This is a part of the peace that Jesus came to bring. We see this, in fact, because those who want to follow Jesus, they get blessed when they are agents of peace. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew 5, verse 9, he says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the sons of God. That as Christ followers, it's our job to walk in and try to create peace. We are to be agents of peace, bearers of peace, because this is a part of the peace that Jesus came at Christmas to deliver, to bring to us. But not only peace with one another between people, but we need rescue from nature and decay. That's Jaws 3, subtitled The Revenge. It is a Christmas movie. It takes place at Christmas, and I think that's all it takes. (laughs) But for those of you who don't have Jaws 3 on your yearly Christmas watch list, let's recap the story. This is the Jaws movie where mama shark gets angry at people for capturing baby shark and putting them in like a sea world place. And so mom shark swims up the coast to individually seek out the humans who have hurt. See, this movie works on two levels because we need relationships without conflict and we need rescue from nature and decay. We need monsters to not eat us. (laughs) We need peace from the natural world, right? If we got along, with one another and we had no more conflict between us, we still wouldn't have total peace because things like tornadoes would exist. There'd there'd still be earthquakes and tsunamis like cancer, sickness, right? There'd be aging. We We feel the frustration of our fragility, right? We need peace from that. We need peace from all illness. We need peace from all pain. And a day is coming when that peace will be reality. This is a part of the peace that Jesus came to bring and he brings it about at the end in Revelation chapter 21, John is writing what he sees and he sees the new earth being established, the new heavens and the new earth. And this is how he describes it. He says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And listen, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Because this is a part of the peace that Jesus brings, that there is a day coming when bad things don't happen naturally. 
This is the type, and we know that Jesus has the power to create this type of peace because when we read Mark 4, this is exactly the flex that Jesus is putting on. Do you remember? They're in the boat at night, right? And a big storm comes and it's dark and they don't have any lights on the boat and it's raining and the waves are crashing into them and they think the boat's gonna sink, right? So they wake Jesus up from his nap and what does he do? He comes out on the deck of the boat and he says, peace be still. And like the wind and the waves and the rain, they listen to him. Jesus walks out and says, hey, wind, hey, waves, hey, rain, go to your room. And they just do it. Because Jesus has come to bring that type of peace. He's come to bring that type of harmony within the world. He has come to deliver that peace unto us. We need, we need relationships without conflict and we need rescue, right? Rescue from this body, from nature and decay. But also, we need relief from inner turmoil. Let's get real for a second. How many of you know it's true? Everything in your world could be at peace. Everybody could be healthy. Everybody could be getting along. You could have great relationships with everyone. Your job is going amazing. But inside, you have no peace. You got, you got racing thoughts. You got anxiety. You got worry. You got fear, guilt, strife. Come on, am I talking to myself or is this real, right? We don't just need peace on the outside, we need peace on the inside because we could, right? Like if this peace is for real, and I promise you that it is, like if we resolved all the conflict between the people and there was no more, no more wars and no more arguments over Thanksgiving and like all of, all of us were just getting along and like the earth was just peaceful and there was no more sickness and we cured all the cancer and we got early alert system for the weather and we could redirect all of the heavy winds and rain and we could stop all of that, we would not be able on our own to match the inside to the serenity that would exist exist on the outside because we need inner peace. And Jesus understood this. This gets overlooked, but listen to what he says in John 14, 27. Jesus understood that we need the internal peace as well. Peace he came to bring. He says, peace I leave you. I leave with you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. And then he gets right to the heart of the matter. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. That Jesus' peace, the peace that he brought, is a peace that is supposed to bring peace on the inside. Directly addresses this peace within our hearts. Now, when we think about that, by definition, what we're talking about right now in these, in these first three, what we're talking about, if you read it through scripture or you've heard people preach about it or talk about it, we are talking about the peace of God. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the peace of God, which is what we lean into a lot in the Christmas season, right? The peace of God, like, like getting these things right and, and having God comfort us by his Holy Spirit and bring that into us. It's the peace of God. This is a supernatural relief in these areas that God brings into our lives. It's relief. It's peace with one another. It's peace with the natural world. It's peace from within us. The Bible actually calls this a peace that surpasses all human understanding, right? It's not contingent upon circumstances. It's not contingent upon what's going on in the, in the situations. It's independent of all of them. This peace sits all to itself. In fact, sometimes I notice this peace when things are not going well on the outside. You can find this peace within the heart of the Christian, this is when I have gone uh, maybe to the hospital or to someone's home who is battling cancer and they're going through some really hard, terrible chemotherapy treatments and I have gone to them to minister to them and to bless them and to try to be good to them. And as a result, I walked out being ministered to and blessed. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced that, but they've said things to me like, you know what? God's in control. God's got this. I'm not worried. And I am so moved by that because they are embodying the peace of God within them. I heard someone say it this way once and, and it was just so stark and I just, he summed it up so well. It was a young guy, wife, young kids, diagnosed with cancer. And he said, he said, listen, here's what I know. If God cures my cancer and leaves me here, God is good because he's in control of all of it. And if God decides to take me home, I'm good because God's in control of all of it and God is still good. See, look, the peace of God doesn't change the circumstances. When you leave here, relationships that are in conflict are still gonna be in conflict. Famine and distress and devastation around the globe are still going to happen. Wars are still gonna break out. You're still gonna get sick. Cancer still exists. Your body's still gonna ache as you get older. 
The peace of God didn't change any of that. It just changed me. It comforted me. This is the type of peace that we see when Horatio Spafford wrote the old classic hymn that many of you know. When peace like a river attended my way, or when sorrows like sea billows rolled, when the waves kept crashing into me and I kept trying to get up and they kept crashing into me, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. This is the type of peace that Jesus refers to in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28, when he beckons us near and he says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart and find rest for your souls. It's this Holy Spirit's work of assurance that God is in control, that things have not escaped him, that he has everything under his plan even though people are still gonna mistreat each other, bad things are still gonna happen in the world, and I'm still not gonna feel all of the peace that I will feel on the inside. It is still a present reality. Because I know that peace is coming one day. I can make it through today. Every week, we have this meeting here at the church called the uh, Ready for Sunday meeting. And in that meeting, what we talk about is, this will shock you, being ready for Sunday. We gather the team, and it's not a long meeting, but we sit around and we just kind of go through the elements, the things that we've planned, the progress we're making, uh, things that are gonna happen here within the weekend, within our services. Uh, We just make sure that everything's ready. And sometimes, every now and then, like, you know, something has happened and we've not made the progress that we need. Uh, Something got in the way, and so, like, it's kind of all hands on deck. Like, I'll help with that. We'll pick that up. Mostly, though, there's two common answers as we move around the team members. There's two common answers. One is, yeah, I'm ready for Sunday. I've got it all worked out. I'm ready to go. But the most common thing we hear, I think the thing we hear the most is, it's Thursday. We say, I'm not ready, but everything's on schedule. And what that means is, like, it's not, it's not Sunday yet. Like, we got time, and everything's on schedule. I'm not worried. Look, I don't have a, I'm not 100% on this yet. I don't have total peace on it yet. I'm not done with all of the work yet, but it's on schedule. I'll be ready, I'll be done, I'll be there. I bring that up and tell you that because I believe that's how the peace of God has worked in my life. Because when I look around, I'm not 100% on this thing yet. I don't have all the peace that I want or desire. It's not done yet. I don't have it all in hand. It's not finished, but you know what? The peace of God reminds me, everything is still on schedule. Everything is still on schedule. We're speaking of the peace of God. But here's the thing. Even if somehow we could settle all the disputes, end all of the wars at Christmas, if we could beat aging, cure all the cancer, stop the tsunamis, and we could get the inside to match the serenity of that then outside, we would still not have peace. We still wouldn't have peace. Because there's one step of this peace plan, this four-step plan, that all the others are contingent upon. See, what we're talking about often is the peace of God. But you cannot have the peace of God until you have made peace with God. See, Jesus came to bring you the peace of God, but Jesus really came, the foundation of it all is that Jesus came to bring you peace with God. This is what it says in John 3, 36. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on them. The fourth part of this piece is the removal of God's wrath. The removal of God's wrath. We cannot experience the peace of God unless we have experienced peace with God. Because of sin, we are all born into a conflict with God. The peace that we need first and foremost is the peace with God. This is a peace that Jesus comes to bring at Christmas. This is the point of the story that sometimes we miss, right? Like the coat, I forgot what I was looking for, but it says it right there, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. And then don't forget the tail end, among those with whom he is pleased. It is peace on earth with those that have made peace with God. Romans 5.12 is a 
massively important verse to understanding Christmas. It's not a Christmas verse. We don't typically read this like during the Christmas story. But if you get nothing else today for just a minute, I just wanna walk through what Paul is gonna say here in Romans chapter five. This is so important. Look at what he says, Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all because all sinned. Here's what he means. He says, sin came into the world through one man. He is referring there to Adam. You guys remember Adam and Eve? He's talking about Adam. He's saying that because Adam and Eve sinned, sin came into the whole world and death came with it. It's all right there, right? You remember Adam? They're in the garden. They have complete peace with one another. They have complete peace with God. Uh, The nature, the world around them has complete peace with them. That's what's happening. And then they rebel. They sin. They do explicitly what God told them not to do. They go their own way. And immediately, if you go back and read the Genesis account, immediately they made clothes for themselves. Why? Well, because death entered the world. Yeah, they're gonna physically die. This is where physical death comes from. But there was also a death in the peace in the relationship because before sin entered the world, they were naked and unashamed. They had no reason to ever hide any part of them from, the, from each other. They were at complete peace with one another. And then almost immediately after it happens, it says they noticed that they were naked and they made clothes for themselves and they covered themselves. They also had been at peace with God, but that died also. Because it says that God came to walk with them in the cool of the day as if this was something God did every day. Like around dinner time, he just showed up and was like, hey, you wanna take a walk? And they were like, yeah, we're in perfect peace relationship with you. We'll take a walk with you, but not this day. After sin, it says he came to have his daily walk with them and they hid from him. It says they scattered because now there's reason to be afraid. We've become enemies with God. There's conflict between them and God. And then because of this conflict, right, that was between them and God, they can't hide from him because, you know, he's God. So then what do they do? They play the blame game when God confronts them. There's no heartbreak. There's no sorrow. There's no repentance. There's no contrition. Adam blames Eve and God, by the way. He says, it was the woman that you put here. It's her fault. By the way, you put her here. And Eve says, well, the devil made me do it. And there's death. And it enters the world. And then it says, just as it entered through one man, it says, death spread to all because all sinned. And when I first read that, I thought, yeah, what that looks like it means is that the reason that you are a sinner is because you commit sins. That's what makes you a sinner. That's what puts you at odds with God is because you do sinful things. And so you're in conflict with God because you don't do the right things. That's what makes you a sinner. That's not actually what Paul is saying. Paul is saying that the sins that we commit are the evidence that we are a sinner. See, sinning doesn't make us a sinner. We sin because we are born sinners and it's all we know how to do. And the sin is the evidence of our broken spot from birth. We are born then enemies of God. And I know you might be hearing that and that sounds like a little extreme. Like, come on, Tim, it's a little over the top. Maybe there are some people in the world who are enemies of God, right? Like there's some real staunch atheists out there and there's people who hate Christians and there's people who hate the church, but it's not me. By the way, I'm here today on a Sunday morning, right? But the truth is the Bible doesn't leave us any room in the gray. It doesn't say, well, some of you are sort of enemies of God and others of you, well, you know, you're not really with God, but you're not against him either. There's no, there's no category like that. Look at what it says in Romans chapter eight. It says, for the sinful nature is always hostile to God. Remember that sin nature we have, the reason we sin is because we have a sin nature. It's always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. Every human being is born at odds with God. Romans 5.10, for if while we were God's enemies, stop right there, while we were God's enemies, which means, that all of us and everyone that we know, either currently or at one point in our lives, were enemies with God. But it says, if while we were enemies with God, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? 
So he's saying there is an option, there is an opportunity because there was a time when we were enemies of God, but there is an opportunity to not be an enemy of God, that we can make peace with God. Romans 5.1, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, When we decide that we want peace with God, we are justified through faith. That's how we receive peace with God. He says, we now have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. This is how the war ends. This is how it ends. We don't come to the negotiating table and try to work with God on terms of peace. We don't negotiate a ceasefire. That's not how that worked. Jesus gave it all up. He surrendered it all. He died on the cross. He paid the price we owed and could not pay. He did what we could not do on our own for ourselves. Out of, his good, out of his good will, he came for us that we might have peace with him. We use the, ter- the, the, the verse, John 3, 16, so much, sometimes it loses some of its punch, but realize that we were all at one point enemies of God and then read John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Some of us today came into this room and as we've talked through this, we began to believe and feel that our greatest need was the peace of God. But I beg you to consider that maybe the reason that you're feeling that you need the peace of God inside of you is because you have not yet made peace with God. And if we let Christmas go by and we don't consider that, we miss the whole thing. Peace is made with God when we agree to his terms, which is an unconditional surrender. This is what it means to become a Christian. The word that gets used in the church often, it's a fitting word, it's an appropriate word, it's the word saved. We say that you should get saved, saved from your sins, saved from hell, saved from the wrath of God. This is the peace that Jesus came to deliver at Christmas. I'm gonna invite the worship team to come back in just a few moments. We're gonna sing and we're gonna have an opportunity to reflect and worship. And as they're coming, I just wanna challenge you, bring this all together and bring, bring a challenge before you. Unlike the stories that we mentioned earlier about you know, George Bailey and Kevin McAllister and Susie Walker and Ralphie, Unlike those stories, the real story of Christmas isn't about becoming a better version of yourself. It's not about trying harder. It's not about being better. It's not self-help, self-improvement, or self-realization. The story of Christmas is about God making peace with his own enemies by sending his only son to grow up, live a sinful life, die on the cross for the sins of the world that those who were once enemies might become his family. That we would go from assault to embrace. That he would bring us in and he calls us his children. That we would be the family of God. And that through his work on the cross, we can make peace with God and we can begin to experience the peace of God. If this morning you would like to experience peace with God, the Bible teaches that to be saved, you'll need to do this. You'll need to believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross and that by doing so, he takes away your sin and that he rose from the grave to prove that he had the power to forgive sin. And then as you believe that and confess that, you ask God for his forgiveness of your sin and then you commit your life to him. If you're here this morning and that's what you would like to do, I'm gonna invite all of us to pray. Let's all pray together. But if specifically, if you need to make peace with God today, he has made the terms very clear. You, would, you could just pray after me. This is, what you would, this is how you would start. Pray right where you're seated. You can do it out loud. You can do it quietly. But you would say, dear God, I admit that I am a sinner and I need to be rescued. I believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose again to take away my sin. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I thank you for your forgiveness. I commit the rest of my life to following you. 
Thank you for saving me today. And all God's people said, amen.